France's former ambassador to Israel, also former ambassador to the US and former ambassador to the UN as well, Gérard Aho, his latest book, Israel, Le Piège de l'Histoire, which roughly translates as Israel, the Trap of History. Thanks very much for being with us today. Um, let's talk about that, first of all. Uh, you know, US trying to do its bit to intervene, if you like, in this conflict. I mean, nobody knows diplomacy in the US and in Israel more than you, perhaps. I mean, do you think there's any hope for them to be able to intervene? And, and why is it so difficult for them to do so? No, I think the situation is, is, is terrible for, for Joe Biden. Well, it's terrible first for, the, for Israel and for the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, but it's, it's politically impossible for, for Joe Biden. Joe Biden is in an electoral year. Usually the support of Israel was largely bipartisan in, in the United States. And in this occasion, suddenly he discovered that the left wing of the Democrats as actually is pro-Palestinian and criticizing the support his administration is giving to Israel. Actually, even among the African Americans, uh, you feel that there is more and more sympathy for the Palestinians. But at the same time, Biden knows that the majority of the, the Americans remain really, fierce, really strongly pro-Israeli. Pro, pro uh, we, we have an election in six, seven, eight months. And with a candidate, a Republican candidate, who is really 200% pro-Israeli, pro so Biden is trapped. And especially because Netanyahu is not going to change his, his, his strategy, uh, Israel is going to go as far as they, they consider it's necessary to fulfill their military goals. And I would add that sooner or later, actually, Netanyahu will stab Biden in the back because of really he wants the election of Trump. So sooner or later, he will say publicly that Biden has not supported the state of Israel facing terrorism and Islamism. You talk about Netanyahu um, not changing his mind. I mean, it's uh, less than 20 years now since you were ambassador yes. to Israel. What do you think has changed <laughs> in Israel over those 20 years, notably politically? Well, actually, uh, you know, so first I was a young uh, first secretary in 1982. And I came back 20 years later, and I already saw how different was Israel uh, in 2003 compared to 82. You know, Israel is a new country, which means that, in a sense, its identity is quite fluid. Uh, it, it, it's a process. It's more a process than an identity. And a lot of really, so first you had uh, the Jews from the, from the east, the Sepharadim, you know, really, who more or less took the power or assert themselves against the traditional power of the Ashkenazim. And, of course, they are less sensitive to the demands of liberal democracy. They are coming from a background which is not Western, Western democratic. You had one million, one million out of seven millions of Jews, one million of Russians who arrived in the country in the 1990s and coming from USSR without an experience uh, without an experience of, of, of democracy. Uh, and you had also uh, the, sec the Second Intifada, you know, the campaign, the terrible campaign, horrible campaign of Palestinian terrorism, uh, who killed in a, in a very, uh, really terrible way, uh, hundreds and uh, more than 1,200 uh, Israelis. So the country has had already has shifted to the right and was shifting to the right. And, and more I, radical, would you say? More radical. Uh, and also, there is also the importance, growing importance of religion. And uh, so, in a sense, what is, where is Israel today? It's not a surprise for me. You know, really, it's the victory, in a sense, of nationalism and religion. It's a country which has shifted to the right, even to the far right. You know, some ministers of, uh, of Netanyahu uh, Gvir, the minister, Ben Gvir, the minister of security, is really a fascist. You, really, you have to, 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 to tell that. And the other side, the Palestinians, you know, you have the Palestinian authorities, which is totally ineffective, corrupt, authoritarian, and you have the Hamas, uh, of course, who, who, which doesn't want to negotiate in the Gaza Strip. I mean, you do sound very pessimistic. We've got these talks, uh, in theory, going to happen now in the US. We've also got other talks going on in Doha. Let's face it, we've had talks going on for the last three, four, five months. Do you see any way out of the current situation? I, frankly, I, I don't see a, a, a way out. Maybe a truce. Maybe a truce, you know, really, for a few, uh, one week, two weeks, 
but for, for, for Israel, if they don't consider, if they are not able to say we reach our goals, it will be a strategic defeat. Uh, and you know, it's very important in the strategic mind of the Israelis is to restore their, what they call their deterrence capability. And this deterrence capability has been obviously undermined and maybe destroyed by the, seven, the October 7th massacre. So, uh, so stopping the military operation now, I think wouldn't make a lot of strategic uh, sense, you know, really. But at the same time, uh, as really as, as has been said, you know, really you have 1.5 million of Palestinians in the direst circumstances in the south, in Rafa, and you really don't see how the Israelis could conduct in these uh, conditions, could conduct a, a military operation. There is always the, the risk, the danger, because, you know, some extremist ministers of Israel are saying that they could try to expel the Palestinians from, from the Gaza Strip, uh, and that would be a crime against humankind. I know you favor the two-state solution uh, in Israel and, and, and the Palestinians as well. I mean, how on earth could that happen now? It's impossible, isn't it? Well, actually, first, it's in a sort of really, in this book, I try not to, uh, to say who is right, who is wrong, you know, really, because being right or wrong, you know, in, in international relations has never been a guarantee of anything. I'm trying to describe what is possible. I'm trying to understand the two sides. I don't take side, and it's not a book for militants. Uh, so I'm trying to be analytical, and how, now, how to have seven millions of Jews and eight millions of Palestinians lived really between the sea and the Jordan River. They, you can't make a, a single state, which would be a sort of logical solution, because there are two different populations, and they have been fighting for one century. It's not possible. So you have the status quo ante, you know, the situation which was before. And to be frank, I would bet more on that issue after, after this crisis. Or you have the two-state solution. And, and it's a bit of paradoxical because we could, draw, we, you know, in a sense, we could draw the, the border of the, of the two states, you know, right now in five minutes. We know the border at one kilometer, really, we know it. We know the conditions. Uh, but the problem is to, to reach the, the agreement, you, you, you need to negotiate. And you have no negotiators on, on, on either side. Uh, on, on the Palestinian side, you know, really nobody is expecting the Israelis to negotiate with the Hamas after the atrocities. And anyway, the, uh, the Hamas goal is to, to the destruction of Israel. And, and on the other side, you have an Israeli government, a far-right government, which is against the two-state solution. So uh, it's easy to bet on, uh, well, we'll go back to the status quo. What I, try to, what I try to do in my book is to say, even if we have 1% chance, let's try. Let's try, let's try again. And, uh, and again, without the Americans, because the Americans are in an electoral year, why not work the Europeans and the Arabs? Together? You were also French ambassador as well, weren't you, to the UN? I mean, a lot yes. of people say that the UN has completely failed over this conflict and over Ukraine as well. Well, actually, people forget, you know, when you say United Nations, and I think it's normal, you have a lot of, you have great expectations. But actually, the UN is really depending on the agreement between the great powers uh, because of the, the veto right uh, in the UN Security Council. And which means that during the, the, the Cold War, for instance, the UN was nearly paralyzed. And, and we, are, uh, we are back, we are again back to this situation uh, it started with Syria. Uh, it, after that, we had Ukraine in two, 2014, you know, at the time of the annexation of Crimea 10 years ago. And, and you have also the tension between China and the United States. So without an agreement between the great powers, the UN is, is really can't, really can't have. Is there any point in it anymore then? Well, let's not throw the baby with the water of the bath, because at the UN, you have a lot of technical, what you call technical uh, agencies, and you have thousands or dozens of thousands of people who are doing a great job, you know, really uh, on the uh, reconstruction, on health, on development. And, uh, and these people, and really, when I was at the UN, I visited several 
several countries at war. Uh, and, and I was really moved by what these people were doing in, in impossible circumstances, in spots where nobody cares. You know, because everybody talk, and we are talking of Gaza, uh, but Gaza, it's awful, uh, of course, but nobody, for instance, is talking about what is happening in Democratic Republic of Congo in the Kivu, where for decades, you know, really hundreds of thousands and maybe millions of people have been killed. And, and when you go there, when you go to the Kivu, you see only, you know, NGOs and the UN agencies trying, you know, really to help a, a suffering population. So, no, I, I still uh, believe in the United Nations. Good to end on an optimistic note. Thanks very much for coming in and uh, talking to us today. Gérard Arlo, his uh, book then is called Israël, le piège de l'histoire, which uh, translates roughly, as I said at the top there, as Israel, the trap of history. Thanks very much.